is all our boards and committees, before we even start a meeting, we always say the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. So if anybody could join me in doing that. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very good. <laughs> I think a few introductions. Uh, I'm Bernie King. I'm the chair of the Board of Selectmen here in Bridgeton. Uh, to my right is Ken Murphy, also a board member. My vice chair, Doug Taft, uh, Paul Hoyt, and Bob McCadden, and our town manager, Bob Peabody, and deputy town manager, George Ann Flack. The reason we uh, want to host this meeting um, has to do with revenue sharing, which um, if Governor LePage has his way, uh, it's going to wreak havoc on municipalities in the, in the state of Maine, um, which I hope doesn't happen, and I hope we can get the word to our legislators that we need to really um, take care of that, because, uh, like I said, it's a very big issue. Um, having said that, tonight we have a, a special guest speaker who's going to do the presentation. It's Mr. Jeffrey Herman, he's from Maine Municipal Association, and um, depending on if he wants you to butt in with questions or whether he wants you to wants to finish his presentation and then take questions, uh, I'm going to leave it up to him. But at, at, at this point, um, oh, and I, I believe we have Representative Gensler here yes. too. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to see you. Yes. Yes. And next to him is Rep. Wadsworth, Freiburg District. Freiburg District, welcome, sir. Very, very happy to see you here. Do we have any other representatives or senators here? No? Mr. Herman, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I think it's a great thing that the Bridgeton Board's doing is to uh, put together a meeting like this. I wish uh, more people in different regions of the state did this type of thing more often because uh, I think it's very valuable, certainly very valuable to what I do. Uh, and I hope it's very valuable to everybody. Um, I, my name's Jeff Herman, as introduced, and I work for the Maine Municipal Association in the lobbying department, in the advocacy department, and I spend most of my time working in the legislature uh, and with uh, my colleagues at MMA to try, to try to influence legislation in the legitimate interests of local government. That's what we try to do here at Maine Municipal. Uh, I was asked to uh, get this meeting started anyway. My understanding is this is, is something for a, have a discussion ultimately with everybody in this room about what the best course of action would be, uh, if any, going forward to address what we all perceive or potentially perceive to be a problem. Uh, so I'm going to probably butt out of this thing once we get going. But I just wanted to lay the facts down, at least as I understand them. And so we're working from sort of the same page book and we understand what's going on, what's being proposed, what's on the table, and then it's up, it's up to everybody here to decide exactly what to do about it. The Maine Municipal Association operates on a legislative policy committee process and there are 70 municipal people elected to that across the state uh, who inform us on the advocacy level as to what positions to take on legislation. And that meeting is next Thursday, the day after tomorrow day after tomorrow, I guess. Um, and so our policy committee is going to be deciding what position to take on the governor's proposed budget and all the various elements of it. So this meeting is very important to me to get your input so I can take that back to the meeting uh, and, and let people know at that level what, what you guys are thinking. Probably the best thing to do is just to go through this packet. And I think by the time we get through it, will be, uh, I'll have all the information that I wanted to share with you out on the table. On the left hand side, the first thing in this goldenrod color is uh, a little thing that we wrote up a couple of years ago called the Concise History of Municipal Revenue Sharing. This is something for you to, you know, take under the covers with a flashlight tonight and read. I'm not going to read it to you. Uh, it uh, tries to lay out the program. What we were finding at the advocacy level is that legislators were forgetting what revenue sharing was and why it was started. It's, uh, I don't know whether it's term limits or 
ADHD is a contagion <coughs> on the whole world or something, but the legislators just seem to, to start forgetting what revenue sharing was all about. And so we tried to go back and, uh, and, and create its history. It was started in 1972. Um, the legislature, in, the 19, in 1969, Maine got an income tax, and the state government began to get some of its own revenue and stopped relying on the property tax so much for state government. And for those of you who are old enough to remember, the 1970s, there was just this explosion of municipal management, <coughs> um, shoreland zoning, comprehensive planning, uh, solid waste disposal, just one thing after another, closing down the dumps, capping over the dumps, just started to come out from Augusta, mandate after mandate after mandate. Um, and at the same time, the legislature simultaneously did away with an inventory tax which probably nobody in this room remembers, but there used to be a property tax, George, Bud Finch remembers, there used to be a property tax on inventory, like personal property, real estate, and inventory. So they eliminated the inventory tax. So suddenly the inventory tax was eliminated, a bunch of mandates were coming down the line, and the, re and the legislature created the Municipal Revenue Sharing Program to help with both of those issues. And uh, the next, sheet. So read that at your leisure, but that's the history of the program. This green sheet is the history of how the legislature has managed the program since it was created. And so what you see here is how much the formula in law would have provided to the municipalities if it had been honored, and then how much the legislature actually provided out of that formula. Ever since revenue sharing was created, it was created as a sharing program. 5% of sales and income taxes were to be shared with the municipalities. So it was a sharing. State will take 95, the towns and cities get 5%. Sharing. Good times, that money went up. Bad times, it went down. But it was a sharing system. And as you see by this and this graph, which is just the graphic analogy to this sheet, for about the first 38 years, the legislature honored the revenue sharing program. It wasn't an annual appropriation. It was an off-the-line sharing system. 5% got diverted and distributed. It didn't get discussed every year by the Appropriations Committee. It was above the line, as they say. There was one major anomaly was in the years 1992 and 1993. Jock McKernan was the governor. There was the first billion dollar state deficit. Serious financial times were facing the state. And there was a raid on the revenue sharing program of about $18 million over the course of a two year period. So you see that here in the 1992-93 area. And then everything was all back and copacetic and the legisl legislature went back to honoring the program. And then you see in around 2006, what, what this was all about were these very sort of small raids on the program that were initiated under the Baldacci administration. And what it was, was a little complicated to explain. In 2004, the voters voted for question 1A, which was the law which asked the state to pay 55% of the cost of education. Part of that law also said, why don't we take 2% of revenue sharing and put it into a little fund, the local government efficiency fund. And, and that would be about $2 million a year. And it would go into that fund. And then municipalities who wanted to set up a new way to deliver services cooperatively with other municipalities or with the county or with state agencies or whatever, and they wanted to set up those systems, they could, they could try to get grants out of that efficiency fund. So that was part of the whole package that the voters voted for in 2004. So that became law. And 2% of revenue sharing went into this fund. But the legislature never let the municipalities get that money. 
it just raided the fund. So it became a little siphon for revenue sharing to get sent back to the state. So that happened, 2000, uh, excuse me, $2 million. And then the next year, $2 million. And then the governor said, well, how about another $5 million to add to the $2 million? And then $2 million. And so people like you would kind of go rump and say, geez, that's not fair. We should get our revenue sharing. It's just $2 million out of $100 million. But still, what's going on? But you can see that the legislature began to get an appetite for this revenue sharing. And the complaining wasn't that loud. And so the two million became five million, and then became 25 million, and then became 35 million. Now it's 85 million that gets siphoned out of the local government fund back to the state's general fund. So that's been the history of the program. And legislators, many of them, as I say, have sort of forgotten the history of the program and the legislature's previous allegiance to the program. And when you talk to them about it, they say, well, revenue sharing was created when there were really good economic times, and now they're not good economic times, so we don't need the program anymore. Or they say, <coughs> geez, if you municipalities just worked more collaboratively together, you wouldn't need revenue sharing. And uh, so if we take it away from you, that'll force you to work collaboratively together and become more efficient. Or they say a bunch of things. There are a bunch of rationales for not honoring the revenue sharing agreement that was established in 1972. Um, the next document I have is this blue sheet. And this is an excerpt from something that you're all going to get in the mail tomorrow. Uh, and that's a, that's a magazine that we wrote called State Municipal Partnership Programs, Past, Present, and Future. And I have a bunch of copies here. Anybody can be free to take one of these. Um, but we're mailing them to all municipal officers. Uh, we mailed them to all legislators. Uh, we mailed them to our entire legislative policy committee and so forth. The purpose of this is to try to resurrect in the minds of the general public and legislators what the revenue sharing program is all about. And so this is just a tiny excerpt from it, but what this book magazine tries to do is, is it goes back and it covers about 20 what we call partnership programs, which is kind of a euphemism or a name that we give basically to state mandates that mandate the municipalities to perform a function essentially for the state. And we, we try in this, in this report to analyze when that law was created and how it's been maintained by the legislature over time with that idea of partnership in mind. Is this a partnership program where we're working together, state and local government, to achieve something? Or is it just an unfunded state mandate, thou shalt do X and such? So, I mean, the table of contents explains the programs. We, we try to do it chronologically, so the very earliest programs, the very earliest state mandates ever, came to Maine in the Articles of Separation, when Maine became a state. Um, and there's elections, animal control, uh, the pauper laws, what's now general assistance, those were all basically colonial era, era mandates. So we track them across time. Then the programs of the earliest, early 20th century, the road programs, basically the local road assistance program was created in the early parts of the 19th century. Uh, the, eight, uh, the 20th century, early 1900s. Uh, cemetery and veterans grave maintenance mandates goes back to the early part of the 20th century. Junkyard mandates goes back to 1930s when junkyards started to get created and the municipal obligation to license them was created. Then we do the programs of the 70s, shoreland zoning, subdivision review, solid waste management, so forth. 
programs of the 80s, comprehensive planning, code enforcement, sand salt sheds. Then we do the uh, adoption of the constitutional amendment to try to restrict mandates, which has partially worked, partially not worked. And then the more modern mandates that were created, the more modern partnership programs. And we try to do an analysis in each case of is this a partnership relationship between state and local government or is it, is it a one-sided, non-partnership type relationship? And, and it's surprising to me that the results are surprising that some programs were definitely created as unfunded state mandates, but over time the legislature has come in and participated in a 50-50 way in those programs. And in other cases, the programs were created as a huge partnership relationship which the state has then backed out of and left the towns kind of holding the bag. So this is, you know, this will be in your mailbox and uh, read that and see what you think when you get to it. This is an excerpt from it on the revenue sharing piece. And on the flip side, there are four bullet points. And from our perspective, and I think the legislative record shows this, there are four cornerstones to municipal revenue sharing. The first one is just to recognize the erosion in the tax base that's caused when the legislature creates tax exemptions. The inventory tax in 1972, the Betty program in, 19, in 2008, the business equipment tax exemption program is the biggest tax exemption created in the history of the state. So those are at the yin and the yang of it, those are two major exemptions that have eroded the tax base, increased the tax rate for everybody else who's not exempt. And, and revenue sharing is designed to try to ease that shift in tax burden. The second one, and this is built right into revenue sharing law, is to ease the over-reliance, the state's over-reliance on the property tax. There are three major taxes in the state, income, sales, and property. Of those three, the money that's generated by those three, the property tax generates 45%, the sales tax 33%, uh, excuse me, the income tax 33%, and the sales tax just 22%. So municipalities have for a long time have been saying, what's up with this? Why don't we balance this code? <coughs> so the contribution, the level of burden on these three taxes is roughly equivalent. When you have, all taxes have strong points and weak points. And when you put too much burden on a tax, the weak points become magnified. And the weak point, the strength of property taxes is stability. You get a stable revenue. There's no volatility. But the weakness is the regression of it, the regressivity of it, and the unfairness of it. So that's the second reason for revenue sharing in the municipal view. The third one, and this one I'm hearing more and more about, is from the municipal perspective, the towns and cities nurture their local businesses. They work with them on planning, they work with them on regulations, they work with them on zoning, they work with them on taxes, they work with them, a number, they provide a whole bunch of services, they try to nurture those businesses. I don't know a town that doesn't. And that's what generates the state's economy. That's what generates the sales and incomes taxes that just happens to be collected by the state. So from the municipal perspective, it's like who's sharing what with whom? Why is it that just because the state collects it, it's the state's? Why isn't it deservedly shared? At least 95-5, which, which has been the case for the last 40 years. And then finally, this type of thing. All the mandates, all the things that municipalities do, because they're mandated to. Why doesn't the state just recognize that with this contribution? So those are the four pillars of revenue sharing, at least from the municipal side of the coin. All right, on the right-hand side of the packet is the governor's budget. And the first thing is just a memo that I wrote a couple of weeks ago about the budget when it first came out. And it describes all the stuff that's in it from a municipal, the municipal stuff that's in it, which is a lot. There is a lot in this budget. I don't think I've ever seen a budget as 
comprehensive, bold, whatever you want to call it. There's a lot in here. Um, and so there's going to be a lot to talk about. But for the purposes of tonight, what I was focusing on was the revenue sharing piece, the exempt property piece, and this comprehensive tax reform piece, which are all kind of webbed together into a proposal which is interrelated in its impacts. So this is the overview of the budget, and in yellow are the two sort of mostly closely interrelated pieces. Part E, if you can believe it, just this one little part, part E, half a page, is the entire proposal with respect to exempt property. And what this proposal says is it creates a new section for Title 36, Section 652. Title 36, Section 652 is the exemption that private property gets. It is not governmental exemptions. Governmental exemptions are all in Section 651. So this is only for private, it's not quasi-municipal, it's not water districts, it's not any type of governmental property. It's just charitable institutions, literary and scientific institutions, some veterans halls, some fraternal halls, uh, some chambers of commerce, and churches. That's in section 652. The governor's bill takes out the churches. We're not gonna, not gonna fool with the churches at all. But with regard to all the other categories of exempt property, that's exempt because of this section of law, 652. We're going to make a partial exemption instead of a full exemption. A 50% exemption instead of 100%. If the property is worth over $500,000, and so you subtract the first $500,000 from these properties, and then you would be allowed to and it created a larger benefit to those people. Same amount of total benefit, however. What the governor's proposing is basically to get it back up to the circuit breaker level and then some. A very <coughs> big increase to the property tax fairness credit. So I want to be fair about that. There's property tax relief in this overall proposal, and it's delivered directly to income tax filers through that tax credit. So what I was getting to is that what the result is, is that the local property taxes will go up because the revenue sharing disappears. These guys sitting at this table will be the bad guys in the town of Bridgeton. Uh, the, Went out now? The governor, <laughs> you know, even more so than they are currently. Uh, but the state will be the good guys because they deliver this big property tax fairness credit. Um, so it's a shift of the way the property tax is dealt with, but the municipalities will be perceived as raising their taxes. Do we have a question down here? Um, <clears throat> I'd like to um, hear from uh, our current representatives that are sitting here, as well as past representatives that might be here, see what their take is on what you had to say tonight, uh, you know, because they're the ones that are going to be voting on this. I have a question too. Can I? If you, if you wouldn't mind uh, introducing yourself and yeah. what you represent, please. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Nathan Wadsworth. I represent House District 70, Hiram Porter, Brownfield, Freiburg, Lovell, which is all of Southern Oxford County except for Denmark, which Phyllis has. Um, I could definitely tell you just initial talkings up there with uh, you know the budget coming down the aisle is that. I don't think there's a whole lot of appetite for getting rid of this revenue sharing. I, I'm a freshman in the legislature. I came in because I really don't like big government and I'm a fiscal conservative. But unless we get rid of these mandates for the towns, then it seems like uh, the legislature needs to share with the towns. So uh, I think that's my view on it. And then uh, secondly, would high schools, because I have two high schools in my district, Fiber Academy, Sockview Valley, would those be taxed under the 50% exemption? What, what are they privately owned? No. They're owned by the government? Yes. They are not subject to okay. tax. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Hello. Good 
Thank you for holding this meeting. Phyllis Ginsler, Representative Phyllis Ginsler. I represent this town of Bridgeton, as well as Denmark and Harrison. And I would just Tell add. Me, would you speak up? Please? Yes, I will. I'm sorry. I don't think the mic's on. Oh, okay. That just goes into the camera. I don't. I don't think I. I don't think I need to. I can. I can talk uh, pretty loud. Uh, I represent uh, Bridgeton, this town. I represent Denmark and Harrison, and I too am a freshman legislator. And um, in looking at uh, looking at this uh, budget process, I would say that what we have now from the governor is a plan. It's a proposal. And the process is to take that proposal and have the legislator, legislators work it. And so I, I think it's a good bet that there will be adjustments and compromises along the way in order for a bipartisan passage of the biennium budget. H having said that, at a very high level, the uh, the purpose of this, from what I understand and from uh, listening to the governor, uh, the purpose of this uh, budget is to spur economic growth. And overall, overall, it represents a $300 million tax reduction burden on <coughs> main taxpayers, ma main families with the goal in mind of spurring uh, economic growth and attracting business either to remain or relocate in, into the state. And I do know that one of the inhibitors of that has been the personal income tax. And it has led to both young adults and retirees leaving our state and taking, well, in one case, tremendous potential and the other assets with them. So I think from my perspective, there's, uh, there's a great deal of work to be done on this budget, but I am glad that a lot of these items are on the table for us, us to look at. And um, I appreciate what uh, Nate said, and I have the same leanings as of this point in time, but I do know the process will be one where the legislators will look at every single item and, uh, and uh, work it to the benefit, I hope, I hope certainly, to the benefit of Maine, its people, its taxpayers, and our municipalities. Thank you, Phyllis. You're welcome. Uh, Rick Sykes. Um, Representative for eight years for the towns of Bridgeton, Harrison, Lovell, Stowe, Sweden, and Denmark. Uh, this is nothing new um, in my tenure, whether it was the uh, sweeping of the fire marshal's fund, whether it was the rate on the highway tax, it doesn't make much difference. The state's always looking under any rock that it can find. Uh, it's not going to go away, I don't believe. Uh, if you look back to the McKernan uh, administration, that rate on the teacher retirement fund upset some people, and it's now a protected fund. Uh, I, I just think that it's a shame, and I, I address this to the two legislators here. Uh, in my eight years up there, I never saw the legislature look at a program, evaluate it, find out if it's necessary, doing its job efficient, and if it's not eliminated. Never. Not one. And I think that's something the state government has got to do. Uh, I, I guess my question maybe to you, Jeff, is that uh, is there a way, uh, you know, when you look at all of these things, the unfunded state mandates and that type of thing, is there a way that, and let's just pick revenue sharing, because it's statute, it's there, okay, is there a way constitutionally or some other way people's uh, vote that that can be protected in perpetuity? That's my question. That's a good question. Uh, good, good, question. good question, Rick. I appreciate it. The, <coughs> our policy committee has been asked that, um, you know, from various legislators, would you like us to put forward a bill that would make revenue sharing protected as a matter of state constitution. In Maine, you can't petition constitutional amendments. They can only go forward through the legislature, uh, which probably is a good thing. And states that you can petition constitutional change have crazy constitutions, uh, California <coughs> being the most notorious in that regard. 
Um, and our policy committee thus far has said, no, let's not do that for about three reasons, I think. One, we've discovered we did, we were the people pursuing the citizens initiative to get 55% state funding. And we have to ask ourselves, how'd that turn out? Uh, the voters voted for it in 2004. It has been essentially repealed or ignored uh, since it was adopted by the voters in 2004. So the legislature doesn't necessarily like to be told what it has to do. Secondly, I think our policy committee people said, even if we were successful in getting revenue sharing protected, it's a very squishy balloon. We're joined at the hip with the state. And if, they, if revenue sharing has to be provided, then the state can, state government, can find another way to carve the apple. School funding, local road assistance, there are all sorts of interrelationships financially that could be uh, redesigned to save the same amount of money for the state. Uh, and so I think our policy committee said, we would like to continue to try to convince the legislature to authentically embrace this concept of sharing these revenues, to genuinely believe it should be done, rather than to force them to do it, which is often turned against us legislatively. Any other questions, concerns? Barry? Uh, Barry D'Onofrio, non-resident. Um, we just heard that the state of Maine is losing its young people because uh, the income tax is too high. Well, I, I, I doubt there's any logic to that type of statement or that type of philosophy because why would you accept a, a job in Maine for $40,000 and pay 5% or 5.7% or go to Massachusetts and accept a job for 65000 and pay 5%, 6% income. Obviously, it's very clear. What's missing here, really, is the opportunities. And by transferring the um, tax burden from, from the state level to the local level is going to have nothing to do <coughs> with changing those opportunities. In fact, most likely for younger people, will make it worse increasing the sales tax versus the income tax will also make it very, very more difficult for the low incomes and the moderate incomes because they're paying the bulk of the sales tax. And as far as taxing the out-of-staters, I think that ball has been played too many times because, again, your out-of-staters here are paying the taxes in this town. And imagine if you raise the level of their taxes, which are about 20 or 30 percent higher than the in-state uh, real estate tax, it's going to create even a better burden and animosity. You've got New Hampshire right next door, so increasing the sales tax for anybody along that border is not going to work, and you know that. Um, it's just a transfer. It's the old shell game that you're playing, and there's no other way to look at it. If you want to play the shell game, you're welcome to do it, but you're going to cause more of the people that you're <coughs> professing to keep here, you're going to cause more of them to leave. This is a regressive idea, and it, it, it <coughs> hasn't worked in the past. One could ask, in the past four years, how has our job growth gone? In the past four years, where have the new people, have they all decided to come back? They have not. This will not make them come back. And, and, and you've got to open your eyes, freshmen or not freshmen. You've got to open your eyes to the fact Maine has got to take a hard look at itself and modernize yourself. You've got to spend a little to get a little. I don't know any tax person, any investment person that says, stay away from the high taxes. They tell you just the opposite. Pay the taxes and make the money. That's what Maine's got to understand. Pay its taxes and make the money. Nobody likes to pay taxes. Nobody. But you've got to do it. You've got to have the reality that you've got to pay for what you want. If you want a future in Maine, you've got to pay for it. Massachusetts has done it, other communities, other states have done it. Maine can do it too, but you've got to have that determination. Not take the simple solutions of transfer. That's all this is very, very simply. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Well, um, I'm going to disagree with them on something here. I don't think it's a, a transfer. Um, they have used this money to look good at paying off other things at our 
to the disadvantages of the town as far as the revenue sharing has gone. So to me, it's not a transfer of one thing to another. It's a transfer it's, of burden. That's what it is. Well, it, it is, but also the point about the sales tax along the state line here. I get taxed every year. If I don't buy a nickel of stuff in New Hampshire, I still pay the state of Maine. I don't have to prove anything. Either way, they charge me automatically because I live so close. They assume that I go over there and buy stuff. So that part of it, I understand what you're saying, but to me, that's getting off this topic. This is something where each town is <coughs> 59% of what we're supposed to get from the state. It's their job to figure out if they can afford something or not afford something, and I understand that because probably most of the people in this room have to do it in their towns, as we do. So what my whole thought process when, when we started talking about this was basically to get them back to what they stated they were going to do. And I understand there's all these other caveats along the way, and those are things that I think have to be looked at on an individual basis for each one of them, whatever the taxes might be. But it's just like this 55%. In all honesty, I don't understand it. Because I sit at our meetings, and the gentleman here tells us, well, you can't do that. That's against the law. Well, why? The state doesn't, doesn't do what they're supposed to do, and it's against the law. So why do we have to do it? I don't, you know, he just says, well, that's the law. You don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> I would, but he won't <laughs> let me. Um, so that's why I'm trying to figure out what can we do. And my question, I guess, uh, to Jeff, possibly to the two of you or the three of you, is what's come down from the governor now as uh, what he's proposing. As you said, I think, it has to come to the legislature and you basically have to form it, put it together as something and send it back up to him. He's telling the legislature, if I if I understand you correctly, here's what I would like to see. Yes. Um, how about say no? And don't do it. Because in my understanding then is that last year I heard all these applauses from some of the legislators, and you two weren't two of them at that time, so for tonight, good for you. But they were all, they were all <laughs> proud of themselves because instead of only <laughs> taking 59% of us uh, from each of the towns, they were going to take an additional 14%, but we stood our ground, and we didn't let them take 14% more. And they seemed to be proud of that. And that's the mentality that I just don't coincide with. I don't think that's the right mental attitude to have. Yay, we stopped them from taking more instead of going at it and saying, wait a minute, you shouldn't be taking any. And I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know the ins and outs of making it something that can't be touched or not. And, I get you touched upon that. So that's what I'm trying to see if we can get a large enough group to make a large enough voice with the representatives and the senators to say, you know, just like I used to say in the 80s, just say no. Um, so that's kind of like, that's where I would like to see this. And, and I would really appreciate, I know a couple of people, I would really appreciate some of the others. I saw the list of the different towns that are here, but to get up and, and to get some input from you, uh, from your different towns, to see how you guys are thinking about it, also. But that's where I'm at. I, I, I don't think that we should stand for 59% being taken away. This was an understanding, and if not a contract, it seems it was a verbal contract. We're going to take these things away from you. We're going to give you these things, and now, now they're just taking it again. So, and to echo on what Paul just said, I, I really believe that the strength in numbers. And that's why we're hosting this, this meeting, this one meeting, and we may have more, uh, to show that, that all these communities uh, got to come together and let our legislators know that, no, we've, we've had enough. They've cut enough already from revenue sharing. We, we at least should keep what we have and not, not, not do any, you know, cut any more. But that, that's why we, we sent the invitation to I think it was 24 towns. 24 and, towns. And, uh, and so we wanted to get uh, some people's input at this meeting and, and find out what other, like Paul was saying, like what other municipal officials are, are thinking of, well, the, the proposed budget by the governor and uh, maybe what they plan on doing on it. So feel free if you, if you have anything to say, turn the mic and introduce yourself. <coughs> 
First, I have uh, Mr. McCatton here to put his hand up earlier. Go ahead, Bob. Wow, thanks for calling me Mr. That was nice of him. <laughs> I call you Mr. at every meeting. You know that. <laughs> uh, Jeff, one issue that we deal with and we feel that's very lopsided is the school formula. Is that being worked on, changed on, looked at? The uh, essential programs and services school funding formula and the way that works, to my knowledge, is not being worked on and looked at in any serious way. I think, I could be wrong about this, not my particular area, but uh, <coughs> it, I mean, the, the, that it, it's not very different actually from the school formula from years ago, the so-called foundation allocation and debt service allocation, <coughs> for those of you who remember that. Basically, every town's fiscal capacity is analyzed. And the fiscal capacity is basically your property value, total property value, divided by the number of students <coughs> you have in the school system. And that defines your fiscal capacity. So if you have a lot of value per student, you have a very high fiscal capacity, and general purpose aid to education moves away from you. If you have low property tax value per student, you have a low fiscal capacity, and general purpose aid moves toward you. And that's the school funding formula in a nutshell. Um, the only recent significant change to the formula that was made is to maybe the advantage of communities uh, like this neck of the, of the Lakes region, and that is instead of <coughs> using your property valuation from two years ago, to judge your fiscal capacity. Right. It's now a three-year running average of your property value. And that has had the effect for communities whose value is rising to soften the year-to-year -year impacts because the greater your value per student, the less general purpose aid you get. So that kind of smooths out the rough edges. Unfortunately, it's extremely negative for municipalities that are losing value because their high value, like Madison, for example, just lost $200 million of value. But it's gonna have that 200 million on the books for the next three years uh, because of the same formula. So what's to the advantage of communities that have rising value is to the exact disadvantage of those that have sinking value. So it was somewhat controversial. But your central question was, is that EPS formula and the way that your exposure to general purpose aid is being changed. I don't think there's any change in, in the works on that. I understand you guys are looking to have a meeting on this. So <coughs> we, we are once we once the uh, Department of Education gets their commissioner squared away, yeah. whatever that might be, and all that. Yeah. But but um, that, go ahead, sir. You had a you had a question or comment? Thank you. Uh, I've got both. Uh, thank you for your comments. I appreciated uh, your thought process, uh, Mr. Hoyt. Where are you from? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm Pete Laverde. I'm from Oxford. I'm a selectman in the town of Oxford, uh, and, and I'm a rookie. Okay, so uh, my my question is: I think we're missing a governmental agency here. Uh, is the uh, county government included in revenue sharing? No, not at all. Okay, uh, so I guess my my question comes down to this: to to the communities, is would you trade? your revenue sharing for a full implementation of funding the schools at 55 percent. I'll leave it to you. And that would, we, we have up here on the these uh, ideas. So we'd like to do a little brainstorming and to go on that, that question. I think it's a very interesting question mm -hmm. and it could be closely related to the revenue sharing. And, you know, Yes. I got one more question. Yes, Ken. Um, <clears throat> Jeff, maybe you can answer this. Um, you know, just give me an understanding. 2015 legislative rate is eighty-five million five hundred forty-nine thousand three hundred ninety-one dollars. That's cut in concrete already. Yes. That one's done. That's the current fiscal year we're in. And that ends That July was decided 1st. last year. When's your fiscal year? July 1st? Correct. Okay, so the only, <clears throat> the only revenue that's going to come 
according to this, is sixty million right. for the whole state. Correct. Look, this is a little bit in the weeds, but let me explain how they do it. When they're putting the budget together, mm -hmm. the raids are developed by projecting how much revenue sharing at that time would be distributed at five percent of sales and income tax. And some smart smarty pants people figure that out, but they're looking into the future. Mm -hmm. And so the legislature at that time says, okay, let's leave the towns 60 million. What's the difference? We're going to take that difference. If the economy at, after that point in time outperforms the projections, we would get that difference. So that's why it looks like we're going to get somewhere around 62.5 million instead of 60, because the economy has outperformed the projections that were done a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. The governor in his proposal is not doing it that way for the next year out. He's proposing $62.5 million, period, fixed. And they would make adjustments every month to make sure at the end of the year that was the total amount. We wouldn't get the float this time around. It would be 62.5, <coughs> period, and the state would get the difference. Sounds is there going to be any kind of petition or letter that the towns will share and consent to our legislators or anything like that as a group? Put that up there. Like we've done before? The, that's a good question. Uh, as I say, my policy committee, uh, my policy, our policy committee is meeting on Thursday and we'll get a lot of feedback that, from them uh, about the position to take on the budget. And a year ago, and this was brought up, that a year ago there was the raid of $85 million, and also there was this weird, sneaky thing that would have taken an additional $40 million on top of that and essentially eliminated the program. And we, our policy committee, got really upset on that piece. And we actually did a little mini campaign to try to stop that from happening. And we had a little television ad and this and that and to try to get the word out to not do that additional $40 million rate. And the legislature decided not to do it. I don't know if we had any, I don't know whether we had any effect on that decision making or not, <coughs> but they got serious at that, at that point in time. Our policy committee did and said enough is enough yeah, and we got to draw the line. Now whether they're going to want to repeat that kind of effort, that level of effort, uh, I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, following up on what you just said, as far as a written campaign of some sort, uh, I know sitting as a selectman in Bridgeton, if I get six calls about a topic, I don't know uh, the rest any other selectman from any other towns, <laughs> but if I get six calls about a topic, it goes up <laughs> to the top of my priority list. Because I never get six calls about anything, so if I did, then that must be pretty important. Um, I can't help but uh, think that it's the legislators that we need to send this to, not just right. a, a, on an individual basis, and maybe that's another uh, avenue that you might be able to help us with, with them as far as MMA, but to get us the list. That, and I don't think it has to be just the towns, uh, just Phyllis, because you're sitting here, I don't think it has to be just Bridgeton, Denmark, and Harrison, the right to Phyllis. Hiram can write, Norway can write, Oxford can write to you, and just because I believe, and uh, I don't know, being freshman, how you if you've had any experience with this or not, but I think it would have a, a massive um, effect on them if they kept getting from all these different towns that don't even have anything to do with them as far as getting letters from them. So I think that would be something leaving here that we could start. The other thing I thought of uh, hearing a uh, gentleman from Oxford is that, and, and I didn't read the list, so I don't know how far in either direction everybody goes, but I'm, I would hope that after tonight that you might be able to pass this further out uh, from, where, uh, from where we are at this point. Um, uh, let's say from Oxford going to the other side, and again, I don't know what other towns are here, but I'm hoping whatever we might come away with, that this would be something that you would pass on to anybody that you happen to know in any of the towns, because it's all it affects every single town. So I'm hoping we can get a grassroots thing going in that direction too, just keep uh, keep moving it. Well, um, what we're going to be doing, Georgian and I, 
as we get into this idea section is writing down your ideas and hopefully to segue what, uh, what Paul is saying, hopefully we will come up with a way, way to address this because um, it, it does affect each and every one of us and, and Jeff and I had this conversation not too long ago. It's one thing for MA to, to be there doing the good work and the lobbying. It's far more effective to come organically, to come from the ground up. Uh, and I think that's why, I, I don't think, I know that's why my board wanted to start this conversation, hoping that we will continue that conversation with a course, course of action, such as this one here, uh, uh, writing campaign. I think it's much more effective if we all do these things together, and I like the idea of writing to each and every legislator because a vote's a vote. You know, these folks represent us, but that's only two votes, and there's a lot more votes out there we need to need to garner. So, and it's been done before, right? We've done it before, Jeff, on several right. different issues. Yeah. You know, this this isn't this. And now I'm talking as a manager. You know, this isn't a handout. Um, this burden falls directly on property tax owners. It's it's regressive in that way, whereas the income tax and the sales tax are, are broad-based. And what I get tired of hearing is anecdotes over and over again that we in the municipalities can cut more, we can do more together. Well, you know, I, I'd like to see those facts, I'd like to see those legislators come into my office and I can explain what we cut and I can show you the roads I can't fix that aren't going to get any better because this is a part of lessening the tax burden on my taxpayers. And it is a broken partnership. The state, the county, and municipalities are in a partnership to provide services to you folks. And it has to be a partnership. And I, for one, as a manager, get really tired of being the bad guy here, that being told I can do more so that my state government can get more money from my, my property tax owners. And I'll get off my soapbox now because this is your meeting. <laughs> no, Thank please. You, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we will jot down, Georgianne and I, as the ideas come up. Speaking of managers. <laughs> I don't know that I ever managed anything. So <laughs> please might, introduce this yourself. This might go into your town. <laughs> your town? Uh, David Holt from Norway. Uh, I'm a little curious if we have any idea as to what this uh, notion of taxing the hospitals will have on small hospitals. I know Bridgeton has one, certainly Norway has one. And, uh, I don't have any sense as to how financially stable they are. When I was town manager of Dexter a long, long, long time ago, uh, we closed a small hospital, and I can tell you that's a pretty devastating thing on a small community. And I would hate to see the effect of that uh, on rural health care in the state of Maine. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, this thing is. Uh, quite uh, far-reaching and its effect on a lot of things. You didn't also mention the uh, tax on the big trucks, uh, the change there. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, what David's talking about is a proposal two years ago in the governor's budget, which was to uh, move some motor vehicle excise tax revenue from municipal jurisdiction to state jurisdiction. And the proposal at the time was to uh, for trucks 26,000 pounds or larger, which go to the town to uh, register, uh, pay a significant excise tax, and that uh, those, those excise tax revenues would be sent to Augusta and not kept by the town. That was the proposal. It would have cost the towns about $4 million of biennium, $2 million a year, and would have obviously aided the state uh, highway fund by the same amount. That did not get enacted. What got enacted instead was to reduce the local road assistance program. Local road assistance monies are supposed to be 10, it's like a revenue sharing for the highway fund. 10% of the amount of money that's given to the Department of Transportation out of the highway fund for highways and bridges purposes are given to the towns to uh, basically help maintain state roads, state aid roads, uh, and that's called the local road assistance program. It's been 
of that highway fund since 1946. Um, and last year they made it 9%. So it was a 10% reduction to local road assistance programs to benefit the Department of Transportation's funding source. But that was the, where's David? That was the equivalent of the excise tax proposal, $2 million a year moved from local, local government to state government. I've learned to stay away from cameras, <laughs> and I thought it was safer back <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, I'm, I'm Dan Marholski, I'm the town manager in Denmark. Um, I'm actually going to join Bob on his, his soapbox that this is very difficult for us as municipal managers to have to try and carry the burden of the state's space. And he's saying that we're not going to do our job effectively to balance the budget. We're going to instead make you, the municipalities, make the difficult decisions to choose what you're going to cut locally. And I, I understand that. Um, doing petitions and getting citizen involvement is an option that we can look at. Um, we might want to look at doing something for a, an article or a, a, a referendum to restore funding, at least as a, a measure of letting the will of the people be known. But I think that this is going to ultimately end up in the courts and that MMA may want to start looking at um, what the, the legal course of action would be because ultimately the, the governor is the, the, the executive branch. He's the one that's supposed to be enforcing the law, and when he's breaking it, somebody else has to stop him. But I think that um, getting the press involved is something we can do, making mm -hmm. sure that the other municipalities join together, um, both regionally, like we are with Oxford County and with, with Cumberland County, but also larger on a state level, and MMA can also help with that. Um, but getting the word out to the governor that this is unacceptable and that the state needs to take responsibility for its own fiscal actions and to make sure that its own house is in order rather than passing the buck down to us, I think is important to do that. Thank you. A yes. uh, quick response to that. Uh, I, it surprised me, I guess, when it dawned on me. Um, so I don't see, I, I have no reason to blame anybody for not being surprised by the fact when you finally understand that the legislature is above the law. The legislature is above the law is the way it works. Every legislature is above its own law. Um, so they're not breaking the law because they're above the law. Uh, there's a word that's used for the legislature to break the law, and it's called notwithstanding, which means regardless. And so when they go to break the law, it just says notwithstanding this law, this is what we're going to do. And that makes it legal. So there's no legal course of action for violating the revenue sharing law because the legislature is above the law. I can't be Bernie, right. Bernie. Are you sure about that? <laughs> I, I'll, I got one more thing I want to say about the, um, the revenue that was taken away. In 10 years, I just calculated as close to as I could get. $320 million was taken from revenue sharing in 10 years. That's a lot of revenue. And, and they ought to be ashamed of themselves for doing that. That's my opinion. Thank you. <clears throat> no? I'm Nell Ely, and uh, I'm a private citizen. But at one time, I represented the town on this uh, economic development thing that was going to happen. It was going to be a great thing. We had Oxford involved. We, had, we were going to do cooperative. All the things that you needed and we needed, it was a co cooperative program. Every town looked at what they wanted individually, and it made sense to. Bridgeton looked at what we needed and we wanted. Norway, Oxford County, they were part of it. Where is it today? It does not work for towns to try to do cooperative work. It didn't work then. The building now is a real estate office. It didn't work. The state has an obligation to the towns. The towns does not have obligations to one another. Thank you. Thank you, Nell. Yes, sir. I'm Harold Goldman. I'm the chair of the Board of Selectmen for the town of Hiram. And there's so much to say. There's, I mean, my mind's going a million miles an hour right now, but let's start with when we opened the meeting, Part of the idea of taking away the revenue sharing was to get us all to work together. Well, in the town of Hiram, there's five towns that work together with SAD 55, our school district. There's four towns that work together 
on our rescue, the Sakopee Rescue. There's three towns that work together on our transfer station. Right now, we're trying to put together a public works with one other town. But, you know, it, it takes money. You have to spend money to save money. And we're so damn poor, we can't afford to do anything. Our roads are falling apart. We can't put together a few hundred thousand dollars anymore to, to start a public works to save big money. So we're not writing three and four hundred thousand dollar contracts two and three times a year. The money's not there. On top of that, we talk about keeping our older citizens here. Keep the young kids from moving away. How's that going to happen? Everything's getting pushed on them. They can't travel down the roads. The roads are falling apart. We can't afford to fix them. You know, I love the governor to death, but he's wrong. <laughs> we got to have some money to start programs to save money. Because if we don't have anything to start, there's nothing to save. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I think that was a, I think that was a great point. I mean, we talk about economic development. Economic development is done locally. And when I bring in a potential business to this town and they start driving the roads and the roads are crumbly because our infrastructure, we don't have enough money to keep up on our infrastructure, what is your takeaway? So to your point, yes. You have, you have to invest in yourself. You have to go back to this partnership because if we do well economically locally, the state does well economically. But economic development is local. Right. The state can do all they want. They can put up signs that says open for business. <laughs> but when you come into a town and you have crumbling infrastructure and you can't offer them what they need in high speed internet or anything like that, what's, what's the calling card? Fortunately, in the state of Maine, we have sense of place. That's what we sell here, is our sense of place, but it'd be awfully nice to be able to expand that sense of place to give decent roads, decent services, because that's what businesses are looking for. So, to your point, well made. Jeff? Uh, just a quick point uh, to this from Hiram, and uh, I'm probably the last person to be an apologist for the governor's budget, but he is proposing in it $5 million each year would be a general appropriation of $5 million a year to fund that local government efficiency fund that was created by the voters in 2004 but rated by the legislature ever since. I don't know, that sounds awful confusing, but in any event, when the voters created this local government efficiency fund, they created a system to actually distribute the funds. And you apply for them, and you, at the time, state planning office, and now it would be DECD, they look at it, they evaluate the different grants requests from the towns, but the idea behind it is to provide you some resources to help you fund some sort of collaborative effort. But when you take a look at this, and what we should be able to tax with this, this new plan, there's nothing there. Look at Hiram, it's zero yeah, across Hiram's the zero. board. I mean, the only people that are going to pay for that is the people that currently live there and they're only going to live there until they can't afford the house anymore. That's right. Right. That's right. And that's where we're at. Yeah. I, th Barry? I think you're all in a vibe on agreement. Even Paul and I were saying the same things. I wonder if I was not clear, <laughs> the idea of eliminating uh, the, the shared revenue, I can use the word stupid. It's just not a good idea. He can't use that word. Okay? But you, you, he mentions the word, <laughs> he mentions local. We've heard local. I think, you know, it's nice to see this with the $60 million, but as a taxpayer, how does that affect me? And I think you've got enough information right now to say if these people go ahead with what it, they're talking about, if they do this, the town of Bridgeton's taxes will go up 20%, 30%, whatever, or <coughs> we will be cutting a fire department, a police department, whatever. That's what needs to get out to the people right away so that they, they can understand it. They may not be able to understand these figures or can't 
figure out well, which this portion of that is this. But you've already got this year's tax, and you know how much you, you got in revenue from last year. And it may not be much difference next year. Is that correct? Is that what I understand? That's right. Right. Yeah. It, may, it may be the same. But the following year, you know, put your money in the bank because you're going to come uh, and, and knock on our doors for more money. You're going to have to. So what I'm saying is we want Paul's phone to ring. We want that ringing off the hook. You've got to tell the people the truth in language they understand. And it means a significant increase in taxes. And they're not going to really be concerned about a few people in, in Bridgeton, but they might be worried a little bit about a lot of people in Bridgeton and Norway and Denmark. So they, you've got to get it out to language that people understand what the effects would be. And you've got to do it early because they're, they're going to be debating this, and yes, they'll be debating it in June, but they're going to be debating it now. So let them know, you know to call them up and tell them. You know, the governor is a little bit off base on this, just a little bit, you know, like three bases. But, you know, it's got to happen. It's, if, if that information could be in the press for Thursday's edition. Okay? Thank you, Barry. It's all right. That's all. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, hi, my name is Rene Lassard. I'm chairman of the board for the town of Waterford. And uh, like the gentleman for Hiram, I have a lot of ideas on, on my mind. But I want to thank you two for coming. Really appreciate it. I hope you stay connected with people as you serve in the legislature. I'm very impressed. Um, I don't know if either of you have built a buzzer, uh, budget before um, as part of a town and seen had to make all these tough decisions that we have to make. But um, I'm on my seventh budget that I've put together. And I think sometimes there's a, um, a misunderstanding that towns have a lot of money and they spend it frivolously. The town of Waterford, we have four trucks for 60 miles of road. When you figure you have two lanes, that's 120 miles. We plow at 15 miles an hour. You can do the math how long it takes to get out and get back. We have um, two of those dump trucks are used. And we've, re -pat we've patched the frames multiple times. Um, we have trucks that we've put new in, uh, rebuilt the engines in them because we just can't afford to buy anything. Our fire trucks, we buy them used. We chase the rich towns. When they decide to cycle something out, we buy it used. So um, if you come to Watford, we're considered a wealthy community in the, in the county of Oxford. There just isn't any money to go around. The other thing when you're thinking about the budget and the $62.5 million that as Jeff talked about, Remember, that's not what they're supposed to be given. So you can start it there, or you can kick it all the way up to 158. You can kick the schools up to 55%. If we all had that money, we wouldn't be in this trouble. Our municipal budget has grown, on average, less than 1% a year for the last seven years. And it's because we've had to. But during that time frame, we've raised our surplus by $1.7 million. So financially, we just had an audit done. We're as strong as we've ever been. But we're also, we have to be very conservative because we rely on that money just to get through until the tax money comes in. So, just things to think about. Um, I'm, I'm with you guys. Uh, you know, I know the governor's trying to balance his budget, but the way he goes about doing it sometimes, I think he's a bully. And I think it takes courage to stand up to him, and so I'd encourage you to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Rick? My name is Rick Parashak. I'm a selectman from the town of Naples. I'm here with my fellow selectman, Robert Karen. And on the invite of this board, and I really appreciate you guys hosting it. Once again, thank you. Um, we're sitting here, and I'm listening, and I'm learning a lot. And I appreciate, Jeff, your, your um, presentation. It opened my eyes up to not only the purpose of revenue, share, revenue sharing, but how it's been dwindling down over the years. I'm also sitting and I'm listening to especially the my uh, fellow selectman from Oxford with his suggestion about um, the 55% mandate for the schools. We did a little research before we came and once again the towns have been beaten down over the past eight years or so for revenue sharing and I think right now it's close to it's about 140 some thousand dollars the town of Naples receives from revenue sharing currently. And I think we're all sitting here today and we're talking about trying to keep 
what level we have now, not reinstated to the 158 million that it was, but to keep what level we have here now. To us, that's about 20, 25 cents on our current mill rate. Put it in perspective, our school district, SAD 61, every year raises our mill rate by 30 to 40 cents. So I guess, as per that gentleman's um, suggestion, are we chasing after the wrong dollar figure here? Is MMA trying to hold on to a dinosaur that's going to go away? And should we be chasing that 55%? Because I think the town of Naples will benefit, well, SAD 61 towns will benefit a great deal more by having that at a 55%. So I guess that's what I'm so far brought away from this meeting. And once again, I'd like to thank everyone for their comments, but are we chasing after the, the wrong thing here? Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Oh. Hey, Rick. Yeah? I would say that, in my opinion, there are two windmills we should we should tilt that. We should go after both of them at the same time. Because Good. I agree with what you're saying, and the numbers might play out that way, but that doesn't make the other one right. So oh, absolutely. I, I, I agree with what you're saying, and it last last year I think it was even more than what you're referring to as far on as the, from the school oh, yes, budget. Yes. And so I I agree in theory, but that was a second meeting that we were looking to put together just from oh, okay. 61 because of uh, ESP EPS EPS ESP. EPS yeah. Um, because that is something, and I don't know how it works with the other towns, but um, as uh, someone, a gentleman mentioned, they have five towns uh, yes, that yeah. in the school district. Well, we have, we have four here, and it's, uh, it's very difficult because I once asked one of our school board members about this, and I said, you know, you represent us. We, we voted, oh no. No, 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 I'm there for the kids. And I said, well, that's wonderful, but who pays for those kids? And, and so there is a, there's a... Um, I guess, you know, I, I'm not going to debate yeah. uh, representatives on the school board. You know, they, yeah. they, they are, they're challenged with a difficult Absolutely. task. And, and I was on there at one period along with Bernie, and, yeah. and it's, it's a very, very difficult, sometimes more difficult than a, a select person. But um, I think SAD 61 especially, and uh, we are in that category that I think Jeff... I mentioned to where we pay a lot of money per student, so the state is now pulling away from us. They're running. They're running away from us. And of course, there's needs, so we keep having to pick that up on a local level. Right now, you know, every not month. There are a few folks to be talked about, and we're trying to listen. <laughs> the warden's in the audience here. Um, every year, or excuse me, every month, the town of Naples is writing a check for $600,000 a month to the school district. And that goes up every year at a minimum of $200,000, which is our part of our revenue sharing. That's what we get, revenue sharing. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm, I'm saying, are we chasing after the right thing? Yeah. Every year, that's at the minimum that it goes up to us with less and less contribution from the state. So. May I, may I respond? Sure. The, one of the reasons that I thought this was more important at this stage than that, this particular thing, the municipal revenue sharing, I see as a, I shouldn't use this word, easy, quick fix. Right. The legislature has to approve whatever they approve. If we get the manpower, the, the voting power behind it up in Augusta to not allow it to go down or to take it back to where it's supposed to be. That can be done like that with a vote. The formula that you were referring to, I've talked to quite a few um, representatives and senators and I told uh, the gentleman over in Freiburg, um, Jim Hamper, Mr. Hamper, yeah. I suggested to him that I would never call him, talk to him, email him, anything if he could explain to me that formula. He asked me when I would be calling. <laughs> And he, he's been up there for many years, and he knows someone who was on the education committee that didn't understand the formula. 
So I guess what I, I, I don't disagree with that we should go for that too, but this is something I think as a group of towns that we can have a, a, a much bigger, um, a much quicker response on. I think that formula and working on that, that's going to be a, a real bear. Well, and, so and I'd, I'd like to say that, of course, I'm one of five select persons, but I, I could stand here and tell you we appreciate the efforts you're putting into the revenue sharing, and we're, we'll stand behind this effort and support yeah. this effort to keep revenue sharing. But I guess, you know, when I listen to the, the entire audience about not having money in their town budgets, well, in Naples' case, if we have a $10 million operating budget, $3 million goes towards every municipal avenue seven there is, school. and $7 million comes up to one building that, and we have very little, uh, I guess, that formula I guess you're talking about, Paul, is I don't even think they're even using that formula anymore. They're just giving the towns, yes, they're throwing a dart at it. <laughs> and when the gentleman here, the non-resident, talked about, you know, taxes and apportionating the, the taxes, when you have, you know, 70 to 80 percent of your money that's going to a school district and with little state revenue coming in, we're, we're arguing over a small portion of all of our budgets. I think that is a huge fix. We need the fix at yeah. the state level. Yeah. So that's what yeah. I took away. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. <coughs> Are there any other municipal officials that would like to uh, see Bob? He's, he's just at you. As, as much as I'd rather not, because I'm, I'll probably get kicked by my board of selectmen. I'm Bud Finch. I'm the town manager up in Harrison. And despite the fact I look like I just got out of college, I've been around as long as Jeff. <laughs> I call him my friend because we've gone back on this for many, many years. I personally think that despite sometimes I'll get quoted as saying, I'm tired of ripping the Band-Aid off one hair at a time, rip it off and get it, get rid of the money because I don't know how many years going back I've been uh, in Augusta speaking on this and other places speaking on revenue sharing. And it's sort of like if you're going to have a session, I've already got it written, it's the same one I wrote five years ago <laughs> and so forth. And I, I think the problem comes into uh, how many of you people voted for term limits and wished you hadn't? Uh, <laughs> The fact is, is we have to do this every year because we keep winding up with, God bless them, people willing to run for whatever reason, uh, despite it, it doesn't say stupid across my forehead. Uh, but the reality is, is what is the big issue out there that we're facing with? And for me, revenue sharing is a commitment of a relationship between us and the state. It's survived for years. Truthfully, if you want to know what your portion of it's going to be, we have about a $5 million budget. We get 80000 dollars a year, 10% of five million is 500,000, 10% of that's 50,000 dollars or one percent, so we're talking about one and a half percent dollars. Uh, that's minute if we did increase it, because the schools increase it, the county increase it, and I can tell you in Harris in my 2016 budget on the municipal operations side is less than it was in 2011, and we've improved our services. So we've done everything that we've been asked on the municipal side and more. When you break the budget down, and a lot of people don't understand this because they look at the budget and they forget to talk about it in percent of taxes. So when you look at it and you say, what is the percent of your budget that the school is? It comes out 50, 55% range for some towns. When you say what portion of your taxes it is, and Harrison is 64%. And the Portland Civic Center, excuse me, I forget what it's called now, for those of us in Cumberland <laughs> County. Uh, we used to call it Cumberland County, but we don't even get that for our money anymore. And for those that think it's just because I'm in Harrison, I was opposed to it when I was a selectman in Southern Maine. It's in the wrong place. Uh, what it comes down to is, is they take another 5%. So up to 71% of the taxes, I have absolutely no control over the Board of Selectmen, have absolutely no control over. Well, you got 29%, what more are you doing on that? Well, let's go into the presumption that I don't think any of the towns has got more employment than it needs. And in fact, in most cases, if there was more money, we'd have more people to take care of the roads that we haven't taken care of for 25 years. So if you cut the salaries and benefits and the cost of having your employees out, that drops it down to well below 
We're all going to pay to get rid of our trash. No choice in that. That's per pound. So you can take that away. When you get down to it, the part of the budget that we actually have any control over, that we could cut it all, is like three to five cents on the dollar. That's what's left in the municipal operations side of the budget. Okay. Give you a big tax break. You don't have to send tax bills. You can save the stamps. My advice is send the tax bills. It's hard enough to get the money now. So when you go after it, you get into what do you do? The revenue sharing to me, and it has been since I've been involved in this and I've been on the policy committee, sometimes we share agreements on things, sometimes we oppose, that makes democracy work, is that it was a commitment between the state. And I'll tell people in here, get away from the Republican-Democrat issue because they've all tried to take into the money. Maybe some years they didn't have the luck because the legislature fought it. But this is the public relationship between us and the state that says, we agreed way back then that since we're going to take this money from all these people that live in your town, we want to share some of it back with the town. Pretty fair. So leave it alone. Give us our fair share. Some people may say, well, the schools. I'm not willing to sacrifice it because you know what? I have no confidence the school is going to do anything to get their reduction down. It's nothing against any particular school district. It's just the way the education. I was a selectman in the town of Wells, I was a city manager in another community, I'm here, and the school education system is very expensive. God bless those people to do it, it's a very hard thing. But year after year, they continue to take three and a half to five percent of the money. And when you get into the funding formula, it's got some terrible things, I'm an engineer by trade, not a politician, so forgive me. If everything is under the bell curve, the norm is pretty good. There's some people doing a little better than they should, and there's some people doing a little less. And then there's the extremes. And there are a lot of towns that's the extremes because the state funding formula doesn't take into consideration that I live in a wealthy community, while Norway, Paris, and Oxford are poor communities. So therefore, I get no state aid because I'm so wealthy. Yet 92% of our taxes come from homeowners because we do not have a commercial base, we certainly don't have a casino, and we have these types of things that all leave us with only being able to pass it on the homeowners. Somebody's going to say, well, it's those people on the lake, they got the money. Maybe they have, but you know what? I can't raise their taxes without raising these people's taxes. That's just the way it works. So who are my big taxpayers? Central Maine Power and the two pipelines. My commercial base, for anybody that's been through Harrison, is the block building. Everything else goes to homeowners. So there's a whole lot of funding formulas out there that are bad. And this part of it, and to be fair, and I think Jeff can tell you the year, there was a time when Governor Baldacci said, I'm going to raid this for even more, and the mayor of Waterville, I believe he was mayor at the time, <laughs> said, you can't take our revenue sharing. Anybody know who the mayor of Waterville was at that time? No. Uh, <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. No. All right. So I, I think for us, it really comes down to, I really don't want, as I said to Jeff, if I have to come back and testify again, you can see how long-winded I get. If I got to come back and testify, it's written, I'll do it. But to go up there once again and fill the halls full of people to educate our legislators that this is the wrong thing to do. Find some other place to do it. We need them to go up and fight amongst themselves and say to the governor, we've got to find a way to live to this commitment to these communities because that's the partnership that we have to have to do it. Uh, I'll leave it at that because I've talked long enough, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Anyone else? <laughs> I'll get up one more time. You just right. want to stretch Absolutely. your legs. <laughs> All right, I don't blame you. I just want to say that in our little town, we have um, we have the, uh, the five town school, and uh, that school is about forty seven years old. And uh, a couple of years ago, they were looking for a nineteen million dollar um, renovation. So. Besides the 71% of every tax dollar that the people pay, that my clerks collect, the town's not keeping that money. Besides paying our $130,000 a month 
to the school, we now have a commitment on a renovation project. So just like Bud said, <laughs> you know, when you get down to the, we're only looking at maybe five, six, seven cents out of every tax dollar the town's getting. You know, like I said, I, didn't, I can't even begin to tell you where the money's coming for for our roads. I know that if we start a public works, we're not going to save money for the first three or four years. It's going to cost us maybe an extra 10%. I don't even have the money to start it. And that would include sharing a public works director with another town. But if we don't have any money to start it, we're going to be continually signing these $300,000 contracts for snowplow services, for summer road maintenance. There's no money there. How far are you from Harrison? <laughs> we can talk. <laughs> 45 minutes. 45, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have definitely been late on the ice storm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to share one one last thing before Bernie gets us going down the idea road and and uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles uses my building how many times a week? Oh, Gary, how many times a week? Three, Three times. times a week. Three times a week. I'm not allowed to charge them to use my building. Yet I pay for the heat. I pay for this room to be cleaned. I I pay for their electricity. I provide them furniture. But I'm not allowed to charge the state for that that service that the taxpayers of Bridgeton are funding. Now we do get some advantage, you know, we, we are able to come here. But really folks, do you think the state would give me some space for nothing? <laughs> Just a question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, for indulging me. So what what ideas might anybody have as to how we can really address this very serious problem that's, that's going to come down Mr. the pike. Mr. Chairman, I'll start yes. it off. A few years ago, uh, I came before I was a selectman in front of the uh, select board, and I frequently only can remember this, and I asked them to have the board of selectmen write a letter collectively to the state to uh, fix the road from Freiburg to Bridgeton. Am I correct? Okay. <coughs> I say we start by every select board in our whole 22 towns forward letters immediately from us to the legislature or to the governor or whoever we have to send it to to get the, you know. Road and bridge away. maintenance. Well, I'm just saying, as far as this revenue sharing, this is a start, just like a couple of people were saying. If we don't start here, when I, I, I believe it or not, Paul and I agree on a lot of things he said tonight, and I, and I commend him for that, because it's, it's all about local, as far as I'm concerned. And Bob made some good, great points. I think a lot of people in this room made great points, but if we don't start corresponding about having this meeting and continue meetings like this around the county, around the state, uh, we'll just be going on deaf ears. What's the timeline look like on this, Jeff? How timeline. long does everybody have to respond? How long does everybody have? The, um, the, the governor's proposed budget is just a proposal, I mean, uh, that's not yet even written into bill form. It's not an LD yet. Uh, it's going to be Create, it's in the revisor's office and it'll be created as an LD um, and then it gets released and then the public hearings will be scheduled. Two years ago the, on the two-year budget the public hearings were held in early March and so if that cycle repeats itself the public hearings will be held in early March and then after that the appropriations committee will be going into work sessions for an extended period of time. The thing that you have to remember, though, and it took me years to realize this, is that the decisions that are made are made before you know they're made. <coughs> they're made before it's public of what those decisions are. Um, and so it's not, 
you're behind the eight ball if you if you just stick with the existing process and wait and then think at the end there will be deliberations and the decisions will be made in public. They're made before that period of time and then everything else is worked out around them. So I don't think it's too early to start right now. I agree with this idea of the letter writing and the getting the word out, expressing your concerns. Uh, I think to, in my view, these decisions we're talking about today will be in the hands of the Appropriations Committee and Senator Hamper is the Senate Chair of the Appropriations Committee and should be a key contact person for this area on these issues, no doubt about it. What's um, more effective to send them directly to their home addresses or to Augusta? What it, I don't think there's a real difference as far as whether they'll get them and okay. read them, um, so whatever you're more comfortable with. Um, the, the, either way, they'll be received and, and, and read, and I think a letter, as, as Bud was alluding to, I mean, these big hearings, the public hearings, they're great and they're necessary and they're part of the process, but there's a huge amount of testimony that's delivered. People bring all sorts of data sheets and spreadsheets and testimony and it piles up. And I can't believe that the legislators actually can absorb all that. So the letter from the constituent municipalities to the legislators, authentic, not canned stuff that somebody wrote for you, but what you're thinking, what you're feeling, expressed to them is a great way to begin. Great just, way. just like when I campaign, handwritten postcards, yep. you know, it's worth contact. I have a handwritten postcard from uh, somebody down in Wells that's saying they're praying for legislators. That's still on my bedside. <laughs> so, yeah. handwritten gets yeah. read. Yeah. Bob Karen, I'm a select board town in Naples, and I understand letter writing, but being around letters a long time, people read only what they want to read out of a letter. To me, what the communities need is this here. We need the representations, the people who voted these individuals into office to come to these meetings, to see the people that they're putting the burden on. This is the burden right here, us the taxpayers. And the more they see this, this sinks in a lot more than someone reading a letter from a group of people elected to a town, in my eyes. Okay, if you come to Naples, you bring the representations to the Naples and say, we have 3,800 residents. If we have 20% show up, that's what they need to see. You know, these people, our tax base, need to come in to voice what we're asking the, the government to do. You know, so a letter is fine, but you all know what letters are. People look at it, they read what they want to read, they discard it. This is what's important right here, getting the input that we're getting tonight but you need it from more people from the communities and the people have to speak until the people speak not much is going to change thanks bob Paul. so where do you think we should go then was was tonight's meeting worthwhile enough to to figure out to, to schedule another one and move on from here and hopefully expand it yeah i believe so I, but i agree with you there's two areas to this meeting that we have to address profit sharing and the school are two together yeah. but this is where we start there's no doubt about it and a letter is nice don't get me wrong a letter is nice but the more individuals that are involved that gets closer to home base in my eyes I agree with you uh, and also when everyone says a letter they don't really mean a letter now mm. they mean an email and if you see an, if you open up and you have 37 emails but phone calls I know it's old school but um, phone calls can really I think have a great greater effect these days than an email um, so I agree I, I, I wanted to hear I don't know what anybody else thinks but I think we do need to expand this and I think we um, possibly to expand it outward but have another meeting um, to move this along but at the same time start with what we've been discussing as far as whether it be emails or uh, phone calls. And I was going to ask, I think you mentioned, or you mentioned differently than I was thinking, I thought the same letter coming from everybody might be good, but uh, you're suggesting that maybe it wouldn't be. Well, these guys know best, but the can't, if, yeah. if, if you get a whiff that it's a canned letter, mm -hmm. 
you know, yeah, right. it just isn't as effective. That's mm -hmm. all right. Okay. Uh, one thing about uh, <coughs> these meetings going between now and June, uh, it's mm -hmm. going to be tough for these guys midweek. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they were in Augusta nine okay. this morning, uh, and they had a session, and uh, it's going to get busier and busier at the beginning, Tuesday through Thursday, and then ultimately Monday through Friday. So you just got to take that into account. Um, that I let the, I let Nate know this morning. Luckily, he <laughs> came. But well, she'll let me know. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> but was I, any of the legislators invited? Yes. I yes. Was, was all yes. Of them? I received a letter of, of invitation. Good. Yep. As well as Mr. Yeah. Harper and uh, yep. Christine Powers. Yeah. And, and the Appropriations Committee was in session this afternoon, and uh, I'm sure Jim was I'm sure he's still there. He's still there. Was there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's probably yeah. still there. So yeah. that's, a, that's a good thought to coordinate it, right. yeah. coordinate it with that. And, and to be honest with you, we didn't know what other towns would uh, accept uh, to come this evening, and I'm, I'm blown away. I think this is a great turnout. Um, so from that, we didn't know which uh, representatives and senators were in your areas. Uh, to contact at that point, but that's what I'm hoping will be the next step for the next meeting. Doug, a couple of things. I do know uh, that some towns close to us have selectman meetings tonight, yeah. and that's probably why their representatives Nobody aren't from here. Order came because of that. Right. And the same thing with Lovell. I, no uh, I was in contact with a couple of selectmen in Lovell, <laughs> and they couldn't make it tonight because of that. Uh, one thing, I've been fairly quiet this evening, okay, because I've been taking everything in. It's been very informative, and I really appreciate everybody's input. It's helped me formulate some plans. But as far as the communications go, I strongly recommend all three ways. I strongly believe in the emails. Definitely. I'm with Paul 100% on this. Phone calls are wonderful because the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And in my household, when I get more than two phone calls on a particular matter, it definitely have my attention. And it goes right up to the top of the list. And the other thing, uh, Mr. Manager, as far as the town of Bridgeton goes, I think we have had some attention when we all sent a letter, all signed by the Board of Selectmen, to whomever we've been dealing with. And I, and I strongly encourage each one of the townspeople are here tonight that that's how to go about it. Write your own letter, but have your entire board of selectmen sign it and send it to the representatives. That's, and like I say, you don't want a canned letter, okay? You don't want to take something out of Google and put it out there, okay? But if you write from your, from your own town and you get every member of that board of selectmen to sign it, it just seems to have a little bit more weight when somebody picks it up and reads it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Doug, you're right. Um, if I, as a uh, member of the legislature, got a letter from the Board of Selectmen, signed by all members of the Board of Selectmen from five towns, that's pretty impressive to me. Send it home. Don't send it up to Augusta. Send it home. That's a little bit more personal. Emails, I got anywhere from 40 to 100 emails a night, <laughs> okay? And literally, I tried to answer anyone that was from my district, okay? but I got many, many from outside the district, which I just couldn't get to, and many of them are the same damn thing, or postcards. That I pretty much discarded some of those. Uh, send it home, an individual letter. Invite those uh, legislators to a specific board meeting. Mm -hmm. And you know what? The governor's budget is only the beginning of negotiations. If, yes. if you want to uh, lower the, the income tax and raise the, the sales tax, and the difference in all of that budget is the, uh, the revenue sharing money. Find some other money in Augusta. There is money there. I'm telling you, there's money there. When the legislature passes a bill that has a fiscal note, and a lot of them do, that says the fiscal note is twenty-five dollars to $50,000, but the department have the commissioner of the department says, we can absorb that within our existing budget. What that means to me is they had too much money in the first place. <laughs> So it's up to the legislature to come up with a, a negotiation process, some other place to find, if that's what you want, to replace that uh, and, and fund revenue sharing up to the, the way it's supposed to be. Thank you. We suggested earlier uh, about the 55% uh, and uh, 
being in correlation with the revenue sharing. Is that a good idea to tackle those at, at both the same time or go with uh, Paul Hoyt's idea that maybe just tackle the revenue sharing as a, I think you said, quick fix and, and then maybe bring in that 55% uh, school uh, thing uh, later on. Uh, anybody got any ideas on that? If that's a good idea to do it that way or put them both together in the, in the same concern to the legislator? Uh, what? You're forcing that, me. Mr. Chair, <laughs> uh, my opinion, my opinion only, uh, approach each, indiv each individual item separately. If you, in fact, put two items together, and you know what happens to us on this board, if we get hit with too many items in one evening, everything gets kind of, the most important issue can get diluted. So it's my opinion we approach one individual uh, issue at a, at a time, okay, and, and go with that. That's my opinion. Okay. <coughs> uh, people have heard you, Oxford. Uh, one one item at a time. Uh, what I when I threw that suggestion out here, uh, it was for the towns to take a look at what their revenue sharing amount is compared to the eight percent they're not getting, uh, other than for uh, Harrison, uh, in contributions from the state for education, and what what do you hear? all the time in the uh, politician's repertoire of uh, suggestions. It's for the children, all right? So what's going to sell more? Pro revenue sharing uh, to the town or the 8% we're missing for the children? And, and, and the state, when they get down to it, they know to the nickel what they're going to have in revenue. There's no question that they can gender up the actual information that they need to tell them exactly how much money they need for that two-year period. And when they figure that out, then that's where they've got to make the decision. They're going to have those programs that they're going to cut, 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 and not give any money to, all right? And let's make sure that the school districts get their full sum for the change, for a change. All right, and that's the end of my subject. I mean, uh, you're absolutely right. The telephone, the letters, the emails, and the most effective is that phone call. And you hear the representatives saying that. If they get five or six telephone messages on their microphone when they go back to their desk, you know, the caffeine high right there, boy, I'll tell you. So let's give them the caffeine high. Thanks, Pete. I'll add in this one, try to make it very quickly. In Augusta, this has gone on for a long time. There's the people who are going to support us because they believe it's the right thing to do, and there's people that aren't going to support us, and then there's the party faithfuls who are going to attack onto most of the new people and try to convince them that it's important they follow the party line. And I think it's very critical that we particularly, and I really appreciate the being here tonight, to hear the rest of the story, because I think that's the real big part of it, is they're the people, when all has come to said and done, that the party leaders are going to come to and say, well, you've got to vote our way because it's important to our party when this or, does it, or defeats us or whatever. I think we've really got to get to the many, many new people that are up there to understand that this isn't something new, this has been going on and get them to understand the importance of the relationship between the state. And I, I can't say that enough as to you get out there and uh, we, we get that done because that's what it comes down to. The school one, I mean, I, I, I'm all for the children. I have three of my own. I know I have two grandchildren. But you know what? While the school's trying to educate them, evidently because some people believe they're leaving the state, uh, I'm trying to put a roof over the head and food on the table. And I think that's just as important to those kids as what they are learning or not. I'm living proof that it isn't a brain drain. I left East Port, Maine because it was life after 8 o'clock somewhere and I was going to find it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're here, you found So now you came to Harrison. <laughs> uh, much younger years in New York. 
and one more thing, and I just, I want to draw a picture for you of what we had available to us in the town of Hiram. We have a hill that's approximately, I'm going to say, 7,000 feet high. Maybe it's only 2,000 2, feet high. But right in the middle of that hill, halfway up that hill, 1,000 feet up, there was a road that was created. The road was created because somebody found blueberries up there 100 years ago. And then somebody took a horse up there and then a wagon full of lumber and then one house after another house after another house after another house and now there's five roads up there. There's no other way in and out of there. Two years ago, in the winter time, the school buses have to go up there. You go up this road, 1,700 feet of road, you've got a 45 degree angle of water rushing down, 1,000 feet of water rushing down, fill that culvert, and all that water was two, three inches thick, ice, straight across that road. There's no guardrail, and then it drops off another 1,000 feet. And you know there was only two grants given out, and I got one of them to fix that road. And without that money, that road would have not been fixed. That road is as dry today because a good job was done, because we got the grant money, because we had a great contractor, because we got great staff. That's the, the work that the people are putting in. We can't afford to lose this money. I mean, if you think we can, you're just putting the kids at danger. The only reason why I feel both should be together is because a lot of the taxpayers don't realize that in SAD 61, if Naples residents are spending 70 cents on the dollar, if we keep increasing our mill rate to cover what we're losing in revenue to cover what we're going to lose for the school. Those individuals who can't afford to pay the tax, the town is still obligated to pay 70 cents for every dollar. So not only are you in a shortfall from your revenue, but now you're in a shortfall for those individuals who cannot pay the tax that you still have to pay to the school district. Okay, so the town's getting hit twice with trying to generate, have enough money in reserve where we don't have reserve to offset the tax base that we're losing for income. Now, of course, everyone can go out and get the taxes and, and there's ways legally to try to get people to work with you, but if they don't have the money to pay that tax, what is the community going to do? Okay, so to me, it, it is the same. That's why, in my eyes, you have to go after both, in my eyes. Whether it's right or wrong, that's my opinion. But it, it's, you can see how one way works with the other. And it's just as important for our, the communities that count on this money to help offset a lot of these expenses. Bob, I, I, Bob? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, don't, I don't disagree with you. The only reason I, can, I, I do agree with Doug on this one is that the, is I think by doing this one first, I think we would build something to where we could go after that second one, which I think would be a harder one to, to deal with. And I think we would have quite the the base to move on from there to the EPS, and, and so I'm not. I, and I guess it, I, my thought is, if we put them both together, it might muddy the waters a little bit. And, and but I don't think we should let up that's on either. And that's why we we were already planning to have one to start with the SAD 61. Um, uh, towns and, and, and I put understand that together first. But how long, I mean, you've, I've been on my select board two years. For how many years in SAD 61 has the taxpayers been saying we need to do a change? Mm -hmm. We need some change. Yep. And in my eyes, there's no better way to help formulate a change now with something else that's just as big. Okay, because it, it's taken a long time to get the taxpayers to get riled up enough to say, enough's enough. Okay, so if, if we put this on the side burner also, is it five years down the road, ten years down the road? You know? And, and, and I was that's thinking the, one month. Well, I, I understand that, but <laughs> we're trying to get the taxpayers <laughs> form, I mean, pushed enough ask, to the breaking point. Ask this board, when did I want to have that meeting? 
<coughs> in a couple years ago. A couple years ago. Well, no, no, but, but specifically yeah. this month. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. But we decided that to get a group yeah. of this size together, it would be easier to. William, just give him my opinion. No. And and, and Thank you, if Bob. I could, Mr. Yes. Chair, to, to Paul's point, we have, we are working with uh, the new superintendent of, of SAD 61 in that regard. Uh, our holdup, our holdup is the Department of Education. We can't get them to respond to us. We can't get anybody down here. We, we, we had it set up until the governor went in and appointed somebody else in there and we've hit a, a stone wall and I, I need to give credit to the superintendent who's been trying to break through that stone wall. But we are going to have that meeting uh, and hopefully we will have a Department of Education person there and we are working with, with the school to try to bring that. And about. we would like to see that happen next month. So. Yeah. <coughs> Rick, Rick Parashek again from Naples, and Naples is not picking on you. <coughs> I don't want you to take that, but I guess just to piggyback a little bit on what Bob said about priorities, uh, in this document that uh, Jeff's email here, it actually goes into the funding of the K through 12, and this proposed budget not only eliminates that 158 million or minus the 62 million, but it, it according to this. It says that the EPS, that model that we none of us can figure out, says we should be spending over two billion dollars. Now we spend more than two billion dollars on education. That's what it says we should be spending the way they calculate it. But it also says that the state share is going down this year by almost a one percent. So they're not even up to the fifty-five percent. They're at forty-six percent, and they're going down. So I guess when you run the numbers, what number is more? You know, uh, uh, one percent of a billion dollars is a lot of money, and is that more money to be chasing now than the revenue sharing money? I don't know. I don't have a calculator on me to do that, run them numbers. But that's what I'm saying, and I guess that's why we feel they're equally important. To be tackling at the same time because if we spend all our efforts on revenue sharing the legislature meets they come up with a proposal we're still down one percent on that that spending on because they carried that or took more away from that to give us back that revenue sharing so i think we're talking we're all talking the same thing here and i think that's we have two big areas where we spend a lot of money and I know, for one, in Naples, we spend way more money than we get from the state on the school. So thank you. Thanks, Rick. Jack, did you have a Yeah, uh, it's an order of magnitude difference, revenue sharing and school funding. I mean, they're just, uh, the we're talking about $60 million being distributed in revenue sharing. If it was honored, it would be $150 million. The state share of K through 12 education at 46%, is 940 million so we're, we're in a whole different world here if the state were to pay 55 percent that would be roughly 200 million dollars more a year in education funding on the state side than is currently the case it's 20 million dollars as a percent of the of the two billion so so 10 percentage point would be 200 million bucks so it's a it's a different order of magnitude the the k through 12 issue than the revenue sharing issue and I also think that the purpose of the two are very distinctly different. Revenue sharing really is for the percent of Bud's budget that is not the schools and is not the county. It is the municipal service part, whereas K through 12 is clearly the K through 12 education public school funding part. So they're kind of very distinct and different programs, but there's a very large difference in state support for each. I have a question for my old principal, Mr. Sykes here. <laughs> um, would, would you a lot younger than him? A little jab there. Not so much anymore. I like that. Um, if you got, I was thinking about an idea for up there, which is accountability for our legislators. If someone told you, sent you a letter, like you said to your home, and then they said, I'm going to watch what your voting record is on this, and then as a selectman, I'm going to communicate this at town meeting to all of the voters, would it get your attention? Would it have any impact? 
Uh, it, it does. Uh, each year, uh, environmental groups, for example, put out a letter about your voting record, and, and I look at that and say, you know, how did I do? So yes, the answer is yes, it would. That's what I'm going to do when I write my letters. I'm going to remind them we're going to watch it. I'm going to talk about it at town meeting. Good point. Yeah, that's a very good point. <coughs> and you did write that down. Good. I did write it. Thank you. Yes, that's an excellent. Any uh, anybody else concerns, ideas? What we can do to get this a little bit more uh, forceful, I guess, with our representatives and. Town Hall. Huh? Town Hall. Where to from here? Do we have another meeting? What, I, I guess I'd like to hear how uh, two legislators, after they have a chance to home and mull on everything they've heard today, what they actually think of anything they've heard. Uh, I mean, it, you can certainly create the mixed emotions over any one of the topics. Uh, the school is going to get their money no matter what. That's the way I look at it. It's, uh, every place I've ever been, we never cut back on the school. Uh, so the state's going to come up with that money somewhere because we don't even vote on it for all intents and purposes in our municipalities and where it matters. Uh, but I'd like to know what they they think on it because there is the disproportionate part out there of under the funding formula how some towns are really getting hurt as a percentage. Uh, the difference between what I pay per student in some other town might only be three or four thousand dollars per student because of the way the funding formula is. I think if I recall right, uh, New Remain is paying like ninety-two thousand dollars per student. So if you think you're paying a lot of money, because Sunday, ninety-two thousand dollars because they have thirty students, but Sunday River who has said, yeah, but we should share our wealth. Well, when you're sharing your wealth, you know, doing this. So some really funding formulas out there that I think are separate from the EPS and the point that they, they throw some extremes. And probably a lot of these Lake Region towns fall into that where the way the funding formula sets up, it makes some communities seem wealthy when it really isn't. And other communities seem to be poor when they have a whole front street, an industrial complex, and other types of things to help pay the taxes. So it isn't the homeowner that's paying the taxes, it's those businesses. And I think, you know, from that is, I guess I'd like to have them be able to come back sometime if Princeton wanted to call another session or some other town did, and just say, we've heard about this, uh, we've talked to our fellow legislators, we've heard from the ones that say we've got to take it all no matter what, we've heard from some of the ones that says we can't, and see what their thoughts are on it. I think it would be good to hear from them. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to be in their seats right now listening to all this and say I could make a, a firm decision on it because we've all given different points of view. That would be my next guess. Would you Other like that? I'll probably ask. Respond tonight or uh, if, if there's going to be another meeting, <coughs> maybe come back. I will say, yeah, just the general consensus, especially from the, a lot of the rural reps in our caucus, and even after Government Page came in presented it, a lot of them did tell our leadership that, you know, we can't stand for not having this funding. That's that's been definitely talked about a lot. No one's talking about the schools right now at all, but they're definitely talking about this sharing of funding. Yes, and Nate has characterized it very accurately in terms of uh, our caucus anyway. And um, But I would add too, um, after having very long conversations both with uh, Bud in, um, in Harrison as well as um, discussions with folks in Denmark. I have submitted two bills. Uh, they are still in LD form, not, uh, excuse me, LR form, not in LD form. But I have submitted two bills regarding the, uh, trying to reach equity uh, with regard to per pupil funding in towns. So th those are on the dockets and I'm sure there are other education bills as well uh, that are on the dockets, but I know of, my, of the two that I have submitted. Um, I would like to. Um, I would like to continue attending any town meeting, forum. I'm very sensitive to and respectful of any communication that comes my way. I save every single email that a constituent sends to me. Now, if you're out of my district, I kind of agree. Perhaps was it was it you, Rick? Yeah. Yeah, if you're, if you're out of my district, I, it may be beyond my ability to keep track of that. But if you're a constituent, uh, I save every single email. 
and um, people have already called my home, so I'm I'm very accessible uh, at home. My husband may not appreciate all the, the phone calls, but he'll get used to it. He'll get yeah. used to it. <laughs> you got that. Very well. So I, I I would just say I would like to reserve um, a comment uh, at this point until we continue. I have respect for the legislative process. And uh, one of the things that both Nate and I can do is keep you informed of the progress of that as well. So, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a two, you know, it's a two-way street. You, you know, input to us and communication back to you. Because I know we're we're in our budget process now. In fact, we're probably going to get the budget at our next meeting, mm -hmm. or in February, first part of February. And. Uh, this was this was a subject that came up because you know a lot is geared towards the revenue sharing and and of course the school um, tax and things like that. So that's that's how this came about. And uh, you know we we may very well host another meeting or maybe some other town wanted to host the meeting. Uh, more than happy to attend any other meetings you know around, but. We thought we'd, we'd start the process, you know, and, and get us all together collectively and get some ideas and, you know, some thoughts and questions. And, and it's been very informative as far as I'm concerned. And I know probably Jeff, you, you had a lot of questions that, that you could take back to the yep, policy exactly. committee also. So I think it's a good point that, uh, that uh, Phyllis made that for them to respond back to us as well. Mm -hmm. Because like Jeff said, lots of times <coughs> we don't even know what the decision was until after the fact. And so we start writing letters and our letters don't mean anything because they've already voted and it's done no good and beyond our ability to change anything. But if we hear from them what stage it's at, are we doing anything, are able to respond anymore or make any changes from this point on or is it dead in the water or whatever to <coughs> hear back from the legislators so maybe in our letters we could we could insist on them responding back to us in a timely manner so that we can sure. <coughs> and and I also think too that it isn't just it wouldn't be just one letter or one phone call right. we have to keep the pressure on yeah we have to keep it going um, Sorry, uh, until we actually do get the word that you know the decision's been made and and this is what's what's going to happen. So, anything else? Yeah. Yes, Paul. Uh, for anyone that's not uh, from right around here, if you have representatives or senators from your areas that um, aren't here tonight, which is anybody but those two, um, <laughs> these, I've been told, are uh, available to take with you. So if you wanted to get it to uh, whomever your representative are or your senator is, and said, here's what we were talking about, and I should move on. So are we going to go with another meeting, or are we just going to go from here and keep, you know, get the phone calls and the emails starting to go from here? Because I think this is an awesome first meeting, but there's much more of Maine out there yeah. that we haven't reached, and I'm not sure exactly how to go about reaching all those others. Doug? I'd like to see us host another meeting here. Um, and the other thing I would say, okay, as, as we were, as I mentioned earlier, I'd like to see us all go back tonight and at our next select board meeting, go out and get those letters going and get those emails rolling. There's no sense in waiting, okay, as I said, okay, it's, it's, as you said, Jeff, okay, it, it's, it's already, it's in the process. Now's the time to do it. Not, bef not when it goes to <coughs> committee, before it goes to committee. They, that's when we should be petitioning, okay, these people and letting our, letting our views know. Don't wait till the very last minute to do something. And not, and not just sense. us either. It should be uh, the, the whole citizenry, you know, because it affects everybody. And I urge our, our listening audience also that, uh, you know, write the letters, make the phone calls to your, to your local uh, representatives. Because it will make a difference. Strength is in numbers. Yep. Do we have permission to, to uh, copy this and put it on our website? Uh, LRTV actually is going to make um, uh, or have uh, copies 
Yeah. Available, I believe. Yeah, LRTV is going to have this on their website. Anybody who gets LRTV, we can make uh, uh, copies of this meeting. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, and you and these are available. Yeah, you're you're free there. to copy this as much as you want. This is excellent. Not a problem. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming.